The world of e-commerce can be tricky, and that's why you need the experts to help take you to the next level. This is Delivering E-Commerce, and this is Chris Parsons. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Delivering E-Commerce. I'm your host, Chris Parsons, and I'm here with a very special guest, one of my friends in the industry for a long time now, Mr. Michael LeBlanc. How you doing, sir? Fantastic. Chris, thanks for having me on board. Uh, congratulations on launching a podcast. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I mean, you've been a mentor without knowing that you're a mentor to me. So I've watched <laughs> you in the industry a long time. We've connected at so many events and, yeah. you know, last traveled time, internationally, we, right? We went traveled. to Ireland together. Yeah. And I learned so much from you. And, you know, when I, what I appreciate about you the most is watching how other people respond to you and how you interact and give time to so many different mm. people. And when I, when I talk to younger people in the industry, I refer to you so often as just a true gentleman and someone to to model after because networking, some people don't believe in it. But when I watch mm. how you network and how you interact and give time to it doesn't matter. I mean, I think the first time you and I met, I was a coordinator level um, working for Walmart and you still spent the time with me yeah. to have conversation about the industry and and I try to do the same thing and model after that. And it, I don't care what your title is, what your level is. I will make time for for people. And, and that I know really comes from from observing you in the marketplace for so many years. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's it's a real joy. I get to meet such interesting people. I mean, if you think about it selfishly, I would you and I would have not met perhaps if I wouldn't have done that. So, you know, it's it's both a joy and and uh, you know I've always been a big believer in giving back. You know, the old and the you know if you get to the top. You know, or, or like me, get the middle management, send the, send the elevator back down um, <laughs> kind of thing. But uh, no, it's great. And you know what I learned? If I didn't understand the full value of that, my time at Retail Council Canada continued to teach me that, that that's associations and bringing people together, like-minded people, even competitors, right? Compete at the mm -hmm. cash register. But, you know, talking to people in your industry, it just makes everyone better. And and we really wanted to, I, I'm glad you brought it up because it's really a question I would offer often answer sometimes some younger, uh, younger executives about, listen, why would I go to a conference? Why would I go to these things? I can watch them on YouTube. There's so much content, great podcasts. Right. Yes. Yes. To all that. But you know, there's no replacement, um, for meeting people. I think we've experienced that over the past 18 months of not meeting people. It's just yeah. not the same, right? It's just, you can't, you know, hang out by the coffee machine and tell a few lies <laughs> about right. about business. But just talk about how is it going for you? Everything good? Oh yeah, that, that's hard for us too. You know, those kind of things are just invaluable for personal development, industry cohesion, uh, all those great things. Yeah, and the 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 conversations that you have with other people in your network, and you take them back and you give them to. I manage a team of almost thirty now, um, and wow, they're learning from me because it's. It's coaching by walking around. They don't get the opportunities that I may have to go out and speak to folks like you. And and anytime I can take a nugget from from a leader in the industry and share it with my group, it just makes my team overall stronger. So I think it's yeah. it's so critical that we we all support each other in this industry. I mean, in any industry, but specifically in the e-commerce and retail industry, uh, there's yeah. there's nothing but positive that will come from it. So thank you, sir. Let's get into talking about your journey. Um, in retail, you are a pioneer, a founder of e-commerce in in this country, and I really want to dive into your story—not just the e-commerce part, but um, the whole. Uh, you're so young, what? Ten years? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, listen, listen. It, it, you know, the short, long story. I've been in retail 25, 30 years. Didn't like many. Didn't start out to be in retail. Uh, did a couple of university degrees, Carleton, McGill, and then did an MBA at, at U of T. Uh, did some product management coming out of there and then found my way into into working with vendors, what I'd now call vendors, Black & Decker. And then a funny thing happened. I bought a book on a site. Maybe you've heard of it called Amazon. <laughs> um, and this book arrived and I, I said to myself, this could change everything. And this we're talking 96 here. And, and, and I had a fellow MBA, a guy named Steve Reddick, and he was already well ahead of me in terms of we went to this uh, York course at York about programming and we were still how to figure out this World Wide web. Of course, we were looking up weather charts and things. It was before browsers were even created, but it became clear to me that it was one of those intersection points in your career or in society or in business where there's an inflection point 
where you can learn a little bit about something and be way ahead in your career. Like you could actually leapfrog. Because yeah. at the time I was having a great time, Black & Decker running uh, the, the Canadian market. And you know the future was kind of bright. I could go here, I could go to the States, I could continue to do it. And, and you know it was challenging, fun work. But, it, but the opportunity to learn a little bit and be a forward thinker. So here's what happened. I was in a boardroom at Black & Decker. This is 94, 95. And they were launching a, this new thing called an internet site. And they said, well, it's called BD Home. And, uh, you know, I kind of at the back of the room put my hand up. I go, why don't we, why is it called BD Home? Why don't you call it blackanddecker.com? Right. And, and everybody turned around and went, okay, you're in charge. <laughs> 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 and, you know, it was like when you read Wired magazine, you knew more than everybody else. And that kind of cemented the idea that even though I was a young executive, I could interact and learn with very senior executives because they're all wanting to learn something new, right? All wanting to learn something different. So uh, out of Black & Decker full-time gig, an opportunity for Levi Strauss came up. It was a contract, so it was a bit of a risk, but they were launching e-commerce and they were launching it in Canada globally because their idea was, particularly at the time, 98, 97, 98, if it, if it screws up, it's Canada. We can fix it. It's not going to sink the ship, <laughs> right? Yep. Um, it's a sandbox. It, Canada is always a sandbox. Great sandbox. We love them yeah. for it. And at the time, listen, man, at the time, we weren't sure e-commerce was going to win. We weren't sure retailers were going to win or vendors were going to win, right? If you think back, like the great disintermediation, right? Why do you even need retailers if you have e-commerce was the kind of one of the lines yeah. of thinking. Um, and so I went to Levi's and, and, and sold the first pair of jeans in the world online uh, from Levi Strauss. And you can imagine the heavy lift early days. We had nobody to prime the pump. In fact, I phoned my friend up, Steve, and I said, we launched e-commerce three days ago. We have not one sale. We worked on it for seven months. Could you just buy a pair of <laughs> jeans from me? <laughs> yeah. And he did. And, you know, we rang the bell. We got a sale. It was fantastic. And then I went to the storeroom to get the product. and It was gone. And it, what happened to all my e-commerce product? Well, we gave it to Sears because, you know, <laughs> we were a little short on an order. So I literally went in the car, went to Sears, bought a pair of Levi's from Sears and sold them to my friend. That's how e-commerce began at the global powerhouse of, of Levi Strauss. And, and, you know, listen, I was hooked after that. Um, and then it was few and far between, like so few people in the industry. Hudson's Bay came looking. Uh, they had just got a new CEO. And that started the journey of launching HBC.com in 2000. Um, so that was a, a mad, you know, it was a fun rush. Um, and then, you know, e-commerce hit the, hit the skids. It was tough after 2000, like the, with the recession. Uh, there wasn't much demand. It was hard to prime the pump. Google was just there. Like it was very hard to drive demand. We did all the things and we were thinking about all the things we're thinking now that you're probably thinking, hey, let's make sure and put notes in the circulars. We got circulars. Let's, let's put ads. Let's put window stickers on. Let's, we did all that in 2000 yeah. and 2001. Canada wasn't ready for it. If you think about it, Amazon didn't come here with their warehouses. They went through a third party at uh, uh, SCI. They didn't even bring their warehouses. They weren't sure, you know, Canada, how Canada was going to evolve. Bunch of reasons why we were behind, some very good ones. Um, and so, you know, we struggled a bit. And then uh, then I went over to do on the media side with Can West, as it was known back then, Can West Media, start a portal, you know, back the portal strategy. And then and then found my way to the shopping channel, which was fantastic. Shopping channel as a catalog based online TV business was already years ahead of everyone else. Thanks to my good friend, Ted Starkman, who had, back in 99, he and I kind of aligned. We got the future vision. They were already doing double digit percentage of sales online. The future was clear. And you know, it was the most interesting thing about the shopping channel. It gave, and we're going to talk about the myths of e-commerce. One of the big myths back then was it's guys and it's kids, right? Right. Uh, that's it. But what was really going on when I got to the shopping channel, well, the shopping channel is women, um, 45 to 65 and 75, right? That's the audience, not you know, 95. And they were shopping. They were shopping online. I said, huh, that validates a big, important data point that e-commerce and that right there convinced me e-commerce is going to be what it is today, if if not bigger. Uh, and then went, went from there and did, went to... Uh, the Retail Council of Canada as an advocate, both an advocate and a communicator and membership and ran conferences and then decided to strike out on my own about three, four <laughs> years ago. Um, 
which was, you know, I was kind of jonesing to get back to operations. Like it, it was really fun being at that high level. You got to meet so many people, but a couple of things pointed me in, hey, there's some opportunities here um, for me to kind of go out on my own and still stay connected. So the Retail Council Canada is a client. So it's the best of both worlds, right? I still do work for them. Many people actually, because I'm in the media speaking on their behalf, think I, I'm still there. Uh, and the podcast, The Voice of Retail is actually produced in conjunction with RCC. Yeah. Um, but from there, I learned so many, you know, so many lessons, met so many people. And today, my own company, I do three things. One is consulting and advisory practice. So I've got clients. You and I wound up together in Ireland because I do some work for uh, the Irish government. And they were looking to introduce Canadian retailers to Irish tech. Um, so some consulting work. And then I have public speaking business. So keynotes. That business, a little bit soft these days, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, COVID was you know, a the, damper to that. A, a damper, yeah. <laughs> COVID was the uh, the big the big wet blanket for traveling and being on a stage. That's for sure. I mean, I remember the day, Chris. It was uh, early, late March. You know, things had started to shut down real quick, and I had fourteen gigs canceled in one day. Right? Yeah. They were yeah. I, they were planned out, and it, and that was not a surprise to me. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be on a stage probably till. 2022. That was my kind of bet. You need to do some virtual things. So I, I do some, pick up some virtual gigs for sure. Um, but from an on-person you know, perspective, it wasn't going to be, it was going to be a while. So then I said, I better up my game in terms of the media side, which is the third leg, which is the podcast. So from one flagship co podcast, The Voice of Retail, I now have seven podcasts, a couple, of, you know, a bunch I host, some I produce. And I didn't start my journey a couple of years ago to get into the podcast production business, but uh, yeah, COVID takes you where you go and, and some opportunity for sure. Everyone's looking for a new way to communicate. And as you've discovered, and, and so welcome to the community, yeah. it is a great way to learn and talk to people and share and be part of a community. And, you know, you're figuring it out. I'm figuring it out. We're all figuring it out. And, you know, the tools and technology that exist today just make it much easier to yeah. I mean, it's still a lot of work as we were talking about before <laughs> before we hit yeah. record on this, but it's the tools and technology existing today make podcasting, live streaming so, so much more convenient than they yeah. were five, 10 years ago. So it, it, it's very similar to e-commerce because to judge because basically right. what took 10 years ago, a whole studio pros and you know, a degree from Ryerson and in, in in radio and tech. Now you can just do hook up a microphone, these great platforms. And that's not dissimilar to e-commerce, right? When mm -hmm. I launched e-commerce for Hudson's Bay in 2000, it was like a million dollars just to figure out how to take a credit card online. Like it was a, you know, that a heavy, heavy, heavy lift. Um, but now, you know, listen, you know, so many great options to, to, to do e-commerce. I just want to touch on a few things from your career. The, I love the story about going to Sears and actually buying the pants and then <laughs> shipping them out. And, I'll tell you when when I did uh, Newegg.com, we oversold on some Samsung TVs, and uh, I think we were oversold by thirty of them. And I didn't want our customers to know that we couldn't fulfill because we were just trying to establish our brand. So we went over to Best Buy and bought Samsung TVs, <laughs> shipped them out to our thirty customers that we oversold on. They didn't know any different. Um, yeah, they got their item. We took a hit on the margin, but I can tell you from a from a customer standpoint, it was the right thing to do to make sure we fulfilled. A, a new audience that we are trying to attract and not give a bunch of new users a poor experience with our site. So, well, it was the right, it was the right business decision too. I mean, you know, you're, you, nobody makes a whole bag of money on electronics at the time, but um, that customer is going to come back because they don't know they need, they don't need to know your problems. They just need to know I ordered and it delivered. Love these guys. I'll go back next time I need something. So yeah. definitely the right thing to do. And then the comment that you had, really resonated with me is like, we, we didn't know where e-commerce was going and you started it well before mm -hmm. I did. I got into it in 2003, 2004 ish. And even at that point, this is how much Walmart didn't know that it would exist was yep. they put me in charge of it. <laughs> 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 we're like, who has they the, saw the future? They saw the, they saw the future with you. That's what I would like. To that's, say. that's it. Yeah. But they were like, who has the least amount of experience running a website? You don't know how to code, but take this project on. And, uh, 20 years later, here we are. So um, it's uh, it's been a journey. So you mentioned it, you touched on it. We're going to talk about myths in e-commerce. Uh, we yeah. might even have varying uh, opinions on this uh, as well. So let's uh, let's get into this. And thank you so much for sharing that journey. It's fantastic uh, that the work that you've done in the industry. And I mean, you've really launched it ahead for 
guys like me in my career because you put up with those battles. You told the stories in retail and why it works. And then by the mm. time I got to the chance to do it, Walmart was like, it wasn't about me selling if it was something that we should do. Everyone was else started to do it. Toys R Us had started to do it. Sears, yeah. I think, was on their third or fourth try. And it was like, okay, we, we have to we have to get this done. So that that heavy lifting that guys like yourself did benefited me greatly. Um, the myths, let's get into it. So let's when we it. talk about um, myths in, in e-commerce, one of the ones that, uh, you know, a lot of store re bricks and mortar guys think, especially in smaller communities, is they say customers don't, don't want to buy online in my community. They don't shop that way. What are your thoughts yeah. on that comment? Well, you know, at the end of the day, uh, most Canadians shop online. Now, we're at a very interesting point, right? Many Canadians have had to shop online, which right. is really interesting. I, I think from a broader context, that wave is going to recede a little bit. The water line is going to go up. Um, no, I, I think I think there's a this in truth, there's consumers who want to do both things. But the fact that they can't shop online is very limiting and will continue to be. There are times when they want to come see it. There's no question. Yeah. Those times get. Um, you know, listen, I bought a, a, a freezer uh, a couple of weeks ago and in an ordinary day in the before time, I would have went and stuck my head in that freezer just to look at it just because of habit, really. Yeah. But I bought it, showed up. It was great. I just I just measured it. So I think there's some some interesting things happening in consumer behavior. And, and Roger Martin, who was the dean of Rotman School, great strategist, talked about customer behavior as a decaying asset on the balance sheet. So what consumers used to do versus what they do over any period of time, particularly accelerated behavior changes that we've been through, are really going to change that. So it, it is it is the case. Sometimes, listen, some if if shopping was just about a transaction, then e-commerce would be the answer to everything. But it isn't. And the reality is there's sometimes you want to go see, sometimes you just want to go hang out with your friends in a, in in the store. Sometimes you want to get it done. It really is starting to blur the line though. I mean, it, it's really the wrong question to ask what they want to do. Everyone wants an experience that is right sized for what they're looking for, whether it's shopping online, sometimes you need it just delivered, just just ship it to me. Sometimes you want to go check it out. Sometimes you're driving by, you're going to stop by. I think that's, we're going to go through an interesting period, Chris, because people want to get back to a normal life. And a part of a normal life is also stopping into a, a retail store. That being said, Many people, I think, I, I've called it a dead cat bounce. If you're familiar, you're familiar with that yeah. saying, so people are going to rush back to stores. I think uh, here in Ontario, they're you know they're starting to open up again, and then after a while they go, oh yeah, no no no, I just I'll just order this stuff online. <laughs> no, yeah, I, think, I agree, I agree. I know, think, I think even from an apparel sense, I'm definitely dying to get back in store and try on some new yeah. shirts. And but once I once I remember that experience. Um, maybe I'll just go back to ordering once I know my size, I'll just go back to ordering those, yeah. those consumable shirts on online again, but definitely yeah. dying. What I tell people, Michael is, uh, people have come up, become a blended shopper. Yeah. And what I mean by that is they're going to wake up and grab their device in the morning. They're going to open up their email, browse a little bit, decide if they want to buy something, typically continue that yep. shopping journey at lunch. Um, when they're supposed to be working around that 11 to one time frame is, is key for e-commerce and and then they made to make the decision on their way home. But by having the add to cart button and the ship to home option, you become part of the consideration. That's right. And if you That's don't right. have those those abilities to ship to home, then they're gonna likely shop with a different retailer and hopefully they'll go to your store. But if you don't have it, then you be you you lack the consideration. Well, I, I think the key word there is hope. And as, as you and I know, hope is not a business strategy. Not a business strategy. Uh, and as consumers more and more look for that, uh, that blended, the blurring of the lines, as, as Steve Dennis calls it, they're looking for a remarkable experience. And what does that mean? An experience that they can remark on? It's no longer good enough to be it's good customer service, not great, it's good, it's okay. We're pretty good at things. There's so much competition. And you know, there's competition both online and competition in bricks and mortar. And so I think it's really either purchased or consumed in store or influenced online. Given the customers, the choice is, is a fantastic option because I think it, it is the winning value proposition. If you don't do it soon, your competitors will do it. And then you'll be behind the stick. And, you know, for that one occasion where I need it right away, you know, that 
that bifurcation in retail that we saw happening between experience and efficiency and luxury and value still holds true, right? There was no, there was no retail apocalypse, but the reality is just tremendous transformation. And, and there's a spectrum, you gotta pick a spot, but you know, if you're gonna be the most efficient, you've gotta be really good at it. But if you're gonna be experiential, you gotta be good at that too. All those things work. But I think consumers now expect and will more and more and more increasingly expect the chance to do all those things uh, for commodities they never imagined. And you know what? One of the things I think that's really driving that is food. Mm -hmm. And to the, to the degree you shop online, I think consuming groceries and my podcast partner, Sylvain Charlebois from Dalhousie Uni told me 4.2 million Canadians bought food online that never had done so in 2000 spins the flywheel of e-commerce. Cause once you're shopping for food, you're, you're through a threshold, right? You're, you right. can buy anything. Once you're buying your food, it's a mental threshold. Uh, it's not accessible to all Canadians everywhere in the country, but more and more uh, have done it and more and more are, are saying, yeah, it's a great option. Not always the same option. It's hard to discover new, not impossible though. Um, but I think that drives this flywheel and that, that, that's a momentum that's just not going to, not going to turn around. Yeah. And a great, great example there, I think is very similar to a consumer that has been uh, adverse to doing their banking online. And yep. during COVID, they've been forced to do and accept that they have to do their banking and manage their banking online. They've now become digital first natives over a yep. course of a year. And that transforms from banking to other hobbies like retailing yep. and shopping online. So now yeah, they can't oh, imagine going backwards, right? I mean, yeah. even in my household, my wife uh, was never a big e-commerce shopper. And I'm like, honey, you know, that's how we paid the mortgage, right? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. shop online. And this past holiday was like this big breakthrough because she did, I think, 99% of her shopping online. She goes, this is really great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, you and I talk about, if we were product managers, we talk about trial and talk about changing behaviors. And, and COVID uh, brought a lot of not great things. But one of the things it done is, is created trial of new things, right. new retailers, new products new ways of shopping and uh, you know, things will forever be changed. Eh, it's accelerated, it was coming anyway, but it really, you know, in, in some commodities, including uh, hardware, home improvement, I think it advanced probably five years from where it was gonna be. Yeah, and I think it just gives us the opportunity to go back and rethink the store and uh, make yeah. sure that we have a, a real good engaging experience at store level and, and maybe that's more, here's how um, knowledge sessions with store with within a store or yep. whatever, but I think we have to reimagine that in-store experience probably faster than than we originally pl planned on in Canada. Well, I, you know, I, and I was talking to some retailers uh, last week, and and they and I asked them if you were to build the store you just opened up in New York City today, how would you build it differently? And when we talk about reimagining the experience, that could be the experience of a Bopus buy online pickup and store order, you know. This store, Nordstrom's big flagship store that opened up in New York City, uh, beautiful store. Uh, it is seven stories and you go in and you walk and it's a beautiful department store. I mean, Nordstrom's is a fantastic retailer, but you got to go down the stairs into the basement, into the back to get to the Bopus area. And I think if they were to redesign that today, that store, that would not be the experience, right? That The experience yeah. would be more integrated and... I did a podcast interview with a woman named Paula Courtney from the Verde Group. She did some work with Wharton, and they compared what are the what are the things the top ten experience um, breakers for consumers. And I looked at her research from ten years ago. What a difference, Chris! I mean, ten years ago the lines are too long. You know, they can't find the associate. The associate. You know, these are the complaints, right? The yeah. top complaints. Now the top complaints are you don't have the stuff. Uh, in your store that I saw on your website, your uh, your stock orders are wrong. Like it, all the top, like eight of the top ten were the integration of online and stores. The last two was like the associate was not nice to me, or the lines to check out was long. Yeah, you know those are always perennial things you can you could work on. That's a big fundamental shift, and I think you know you got me thinking about how to design the store you want, and what does that store look like. Nordstrom, mm -hmm. another great example, they've designed Nordstrom local stores where they're not big and building up big department stores. They're opening up mini stores that they're only for pickup and drop off returns, 
we got to talk about returns. Returns is the most low high low hanging fruit for improvement for retailers, I believe. Yep. Uh, the returns experience, however that manifests itself, is the most one of the most important experiences in the in the entire customer journey. Yeah, I agree. I think so many people talk about returns as such a negative, but at the same time, it's an opportunity to sell or to engage with the customer and give them confidence to come back to your yeah. store again. Yeah. So I think it's, yes, yeah. it's costly to do returns, but it's also an opportunity to gain lifetime value from a customer. A absolutely. It is done well. Returns done well, reinforce your brand and the customer experience. Now, where I think returns needs to go is it needs to be as convenient as and as many options as you have for getting delivery. Think about that. Yeah. So you can choose faster, slower, home delivery, BOPUS. You are going to need to really, I think a great place to focus on in the years to come is how do I match that convenience and service level with return logistics? How do yeah. I make that better? And how do I, because it's a win. And as you said, you know, very savvy point, right? It lowers the barrier to any resistance. If you're on the fence about something and you know the returns process is pretty seamless, you'll buy it, Yep. right? Um, you'll buy it because you're confident they're going to take it back. It's a great, re you know, home home hardware, for example. You know, I'm very confident that if I buy something and it doesn't work out, I, you know, I'm going to be taken care of. I have no doubt of that in my mind. Yeah. So that's huge because, I, it, you know, on those items that I'm, on the fence about that pushes me on pushes me in and, and over to uh, to buy it yeah you're more likely to convert because you have that confidence to yeah. shop yeah yeah you, it, it's a funny balance though i, I just yeah. you know I, I i've worked that balance at the shopping channel and sometimes you go too far if you yeah. make it too easy and you know one of the things we were doing we were putting a self-returned label to return stuff and that was your first experience in the box and our returns went up because it it was just like Oh, I can return this. Well, I'm going to go ahead and return it. <laughs> like it's a real sweet spot between, um, you know, it's a science, it's an art and a science. I think it's, it's deserves more attention than it probably gets on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, before we get on to myth number two, um, I just wanted to touch on this shopping channel there. You talked about stuff that you were being innovative back then. You see the big trends in the industry now with live selling and influencers doing live videos and selling through, through their channel. This is stuff that you did years ago and now yeah. it's the hottest trend in the industry right now in other in other countries and coming yeah. coming to north america or canada really quickly well i tell you whether it's uh, today's shopping choice which is the new brand for the shopping yeah. channel uh, or whether it's qvc which is curate it's known as curate in the states which is the old qvc hsn i mean these these companies have been doing it for 30 years yeah. they got the model they got the, the you know everybody goes it's new and it's not new. We, you know, the shopping channel, we did it seven days a week, 18 hours a day live, 364 days uh, measured to the nickel dollar per minute sales. It's, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic vehicle. And they, you learn the trade craft. Like there's a trade craft to sell. You just don't start up and just start, you know, ramming about stuff. And the guests are very important. You know, f lots of funny things. I met all kinds of interesting people, Suzanne Summers, Joan Rivers, Kim Kardashian. And what you learn pretty quickly is it's hard. It's hard to do because you've got, you got no script and you got to be interesting and you got to be, you know, you got to cycle through product benefits. It is easier said than done in some ways, just like a great podcast. Yeah. And, you know, I bet you when you have guests like that, you have to be able to roll with the punches as they're having dialogue coming out of nowhere. Right. And you just got to, you can't look shocked on screen. <laughs> Well, it was hard not to. I remember I was in the studio and, jo and Joan Rivers was just a hoot. I got to know Joan um, and uh, she got mad at one of the stage hands and literally on camera picks, picked up one of the props and threw it at his head. And and we all kind of went and then kind of re regained our composure. Yeah, lots of stuff goes on behind the scenes for sure. But, uh, you know, listen, it's it's a great way of selling. There's no better way to to work through that product ladder, right, of you know, yeah. technical, functional, and emotional benefits. Start over again, technical, functional, and emotional benefits. And it's it's a discipline and it's a rigor. And can you do it on your mobile phone? Can influencers do it? Can you engage people to do it? Yes, but it's not easy. Yeah, okay. Myth number two, online is going to cannibalize my in-store sales. And some people think up to 50%. 
Yeah, it's it's kind of asking the wrong question, right? It's an old chestnut. I've been dealing with that for my entire career. We're gonna. It basically says we're gonna sell it anyway, right? right? And and to some degree, um, yes, but in many degrees, you may not. And again, hope is not a strategy. Uh, people are going to shift not because you can sell it online, and they'll look for other alternatives. So in a world where there's only one place selling one thing, um, you know, that's not really the reality anymore. So I think it's a, it's an old chestnut. Um, yes, there are some people who would have come to the store to buy it, uh, but I guarantee that they would also look around to shop online if that's something they're going to buy online. And that increasingly is more and more and more commodities. Yeah, and I think the other piece is okay. Let's let's go with the premise that they're going to make. We're going to take fifty percent of the sales. Yeah. But our customers building better, bigger baskets online. In my history, they've always built bigger baskets online than the retail store. So you are now influencing a larger revenue stream for your organization. And that all goes back to the store and the big pie, pie for the company anyways. So, okay, we may take 50%, but how much are we influencing? What's the effect from, you know, yeah. what's the average conversion on a, on an e-commerce platform? One to 3%. Um, so what are the other 97% of the customers doing that are That's on right. your e-commerce platform? They're, they're researching. Yeah. And I, and I think though, the, the, the advice I'd have to e-commerce professionals when you're talking about that is there's a kernel of truth to it, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, describing it as cannibalization is a bit of a red herring, but if you just allow, not allow, but if someone just goes into your site, buys something and you never talk to them again, you know, you're probably not going to maximize your opportunities. It is the beginning of the discussion, not the end of it. So, you know, when they come to the store, a great manager, a great store manager, um, even if they don't know the customer will, you know, will help them out. Maybe they'll buy one thing. Maybe they came to buy one and they buy three. Maybe they're encouraged to buy, hey, did you see this on sale? Uh, it's a real hot seller and they'll buy that thing. Like, how do you, how do you model that and mirror that online? Harder, as you know, not easy. Uh, and that is ground that, uh, that we continue to work on. Um, you know, the idea of inspiration and impulse buying online is harder than it is in store, but it's uh, it's coming. And that, that could be a follow-up email. That could be a follow-up text. Hey, you bought this. Uh, I'm sure you'd like that. I mean, that idea has been around for since McDonald's offered you French fries with your chocolate milkshake, right? Yeah. If you like this, you might like some of that. Uh, the degree that you can get, you know, smart about it and a good merchant knows what to offer them you know, sell them some replacement batteries, sell them some replacement buffing pads, whatever it takes to model what a great store manager would do um, to make it not, you know, cannibal Asia, you know, to make it one plus one equals three. Right. And if, if your customer happened to purchase off of your website, the latest and greatest barbecue as a store manager, that's now an opportunity to reach out to that customer and say, here's the, here's the barbecue cover that you didn't get when you were shopping online or here's right. the, accessories that you need or by the way that we've now got a gazebo for barbecues right so there's so many now touch points regardless of who got that initial sale that a store can play a part and a role in in selling it, to them a second third fourth time that's right that's right and and taking it one step further uh with your barbecue example which i love i just bought my fifth barbecue um so a bit of a nut for barbecues um you know offer me a service online where you ship me briquettes once a month, right, and it just shows up at my door. And and again, um, maybe you'll come back to buy it from where you bought the barbecue, but maybe you'll just buy it where you're close to at work or play or the cottage. You know, take advantage of what you can for these fulfillment, refillment, revenue opportunities. The those are great, by the way, at the shopping channel. And and uh, you know, buy this, and then we'll ship it to you every thirty or sixty days. A replen, you know, the replenishment business. All um, these subscriptions, Michael, I'm addicted yeah. to them. I have soap coming to me. I have my razor blades <laughs> coming to me. It's it's amazing. They they get me hooked every time. But it's the convenience. I can't pass it up. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got it for pet food uh, right. from someone you used to work for, uh, from uh, Ren's Pets. Ren's Pets, great group. Uh, of people. Love Ren's Pets. I love what they do. And uh, listen, I I I'm not. You know, I got a big dog. I get no joy in going to the pet store. That's mm -hmm. not for me. Um, I'm not that engaged. I don't need to go to the dog. I don't need, I don't get a great experience. Go to the pet store and lugging home a 50 pound bag of food right. um, for my dog. I love the fact that it just shows up on my doorstep when I need it. Love it.
Love yeah, it. And, and there was Fantastic. the whole debate about whether, you know, you stop customers from coming in and building a basket because they just get this reoccurring dog food. But ultimately, if a person cares about their pet, they're going to be in there for the treats, yeah. the toys, the experience of those stores. Those stores that Renz has are amazing. Um, clean, tidy, store expertise, yeah. the product knowledge that those associates have. Um, yep. you, you can't, you can't replicate that online right now. So no. So um, if I need, if I need a recommendation, but you know, they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, it's a good lesson for us because you know, they, they, they send out an email. They seem to be taking a look at what you're buying and saying, you know, we realize you've got a German shepherd Rottweiler, so we're not going to try and sell you a, a, you know, a lap dog type toy, basic block and tackling in e-commerce, but it, it, yeah. it, you know, it's, it works, you know, we, we buy all kinds of stuff from them. And I haven't stepped foot in a Ren store in 18 months. Right, right. All right, myth number three. Consumers are only price sensitive when it comes to shopping online. They only want to buy those, those items that go on sale. Yeah, it, you know, I think there, there is a kernel of truth that Canadians are extremely value oriented. Uh, and there's also the kernel of truth that e-commerce exposes perfect-ish pricing perfection. Um, should I look for a better price for a like-minded thing? If it was all just about price, uh, then, you know, it would all just be about a couple of retailers and not, they're not even that great on price uniformly across right. you know, all the products. So no, it's not about price. It's about that basket of things, which is, am I going to get it on time? Can I return it? Uh, do I trust them? I think, you know, back actually, it's interesting because in the early days, e-commerce, we relied heavily on, is it a safe credit card transaction? We don't mm -hmm. talk about that too much anymore. I mean, as you know, the risk is on the merchant side, but you really don't see that as a barrier. That was one of, you know, when I was first doing e-commerce, that was one of the top one or two barriers. You know, is it safe to transact online with my credit card? I think we're long past that. Um, so then it becomes, well, you know, can I trust them? Is it going to show up? Are they going to ship me what I asked for? Um, all those kind of things go into price. And, and there's, you know, I've looked many times when I've seen price and said, you know, plus or minus, uh, I'll go with the one I trust more, the one I think they're going to do a better job. And uh, sometimes I'll, you know, sometimes, again, if I'm on the fence about a product, I'll buy it from a brick and mortar so I know I can return it easier. Yeah. All those things kind of go in. So, no, I, I think I think there's a kernel of truth. People, people price shop because Canadians price shop. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's it's what it's what we do. It's no surprise you, we would also do it online, but to the exclusion of all other considerations, I don't think so. No, I agree. I mean, people have been price sensitive forever. You used to sit at your coffee sure. table with every flyer open and right. go in and compare the flyers and grab coupons out of them. And, and now that you can do that in a digital experience, there's really no difference. It's just a little bit more convenient yep. for a customer. But I, I love what you said about the value. Canadians, I think, appreciate more value versus a discount on a single item. It's that whole offer your whole proposition and and you may be a retailer that offers just great content and if you're priced higher mm -hmm. by two to five percent i'm willing to pay that difference because you're making me have confidence in that purchase decision that's right or your product is unique or 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 like if mm -hmm. if i mean sometimes some of the products you have are price fighters right you know that merchants are going to have a strategy where they're going to fight on price on some key products Right. Maybe they they private label. Maybe they're just going to fight on price. They're going to make a statement on certain products and they're going to offer it on price. Others, you know, it doesn't have to be uniformly the case. I mean, I, you know, one of the best things we did at Zellers, and this is an offline example, is uh, back when we were competing with Walmart, is we we assembled two shopping baskets at the front of the store. And we said, these are identical items. Here's how much this basket is and here how much this other basket is. So, you know, perception is very important. Um, you know, lowest price is the law kind of stuff. Uh, but it's not, you know, sometimes it comes down to price. Sometimes it is a low price on one item, but not the other. It's a basket of goods. Um, hey, listen, price is important, cost is important. You can't be out of whack, right? If you're out of line for like-to-like -like items for somebody you, you trust equally, you're probably not going to get that sale. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. So myth number four is actually one that I brought up because I know a couple of small retailers that have gone out of business during COVID and they didn't, they didn't adapt or pivot during COVID. They were traditional bricks and mortar store and they just wanted consumers to, 
to call in and that was the method of of getting the product mm. they didn't have a website and and basically the comment from from the folks that i was speaking to was it's too much work to sell through other channels and i mean having that perspective now i think if they could go back 18 months they would <laughs> right. they would have put in that right. extra effort the alternative is worse basically right. the alternative is worse yeah <clears throat> so what are your thoughts on that comment it's gonna and both of us I know we will not lie that e-commerce is a lot of work, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I mean, listen, my number, I, you know, when I'm invite, when I talk to, um, I was talking to the media who kind of talked to store owners, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. And I said, listen, um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Next best time is today. If you're just get started and get going, but don't think starting e-commerce is something you can do off the corner of your desk and be successful at it. And this is the 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 paradox of the platforms now, right? Yeah. Shopify, it's very easy to launch an e-commerce site. Like re, like when I think about the grief I went through, you know, 20 years ago to launch an e-commerce site. It's ridiculously easy for anyone at any size to launch an e-commerce site. Yeah. Doesn't mean you're going to be successful, right? And the mechanics, the plumbing, that comes easy. But you you have to look at it like you're opening an entire new store. And you know, where I find Indies or all retailers kind of underestimate the amount of work to be successful at it, right? Sometimes you can be lucky, uh, but again, luck, not a strategy. It is a lot of work. Um, and, you know, the phone, you know, people aren't going to phone in. They're just not going to do it. Now, is it easy to get their attention if you haven't built a community in social media? No, um, but you got to start. And I think, you know, when I think of the Main Street retailers I talk to who are more successful, they already were managing a community. They'd already made that commitment, which sometimes they would question. Hey, I spent so much time online. I don't know what it's helping. They now know. Like right. they now know that community is what kept them in business. Uh, they developed some cohesion. It's interesting. I got new products. And really, Chris, this is where the browsing happened. Like people browsed over the COVID era online. I mean, this is a big transformation that we, we can talk about later, but you know, there wasn't much browsing in stores during the COVID era. I just want to get in and get out, right? That yeah. was the customer behavior. Yeah. There wasn't, nobody was just popping into a store to check it out. I'd love to do that again. That time will come soon. But a lot of it was, um, you know, research online, shop in store, that will continue. But to your point, uh, yes, uh, no matter what your size is, you should have an e-commerce site, but you should take it seriously. Getting traffic takes time, mm -hmm. takes an investment. It all takes time. Yes, just like running your store. What I loved is an example that I, I think it was out of New York City, if I remember the article correctly, um, a bunch of store owners got together and built basically their own community marketplace. Mm. Um, yep. So it wasn't a heavy lift on one individual mom and pop store, but this whole street, this whole community got together, built a website, and were able to service from one, one platform a number of their brands which I thought was just so clever and collaborative that made yep. a lot of sense because maybe someone had a skill set on development, maybe someone had a skill set on a pricing strategy, whatever it was. This community worked really well during COVID together, and they all they all stayed open because they had this micro marketplace. Well, and it, it's a great point, and and if you think of what's happening in Quebec, they're doing that on a larger scale. Panet Bleu, which is being run in in Quebec, is a place for consumers to go to find all the local retailers who sell online, to put them all together in a place. Uh, you know, I was I was looking at one of the industries that was really hard hit in COVID, of course, was the beer industry. So, you know, the restaurants shut down, it's a strangled a lot of volume and, and the laws changed. They could suddenly ship to home, but I didn't know that for all the brands that I might shop for. So they all got together and created a single site. It wasn't even as sophisticated as a common transactional platform. They all had a transactional platform. It was like old school portal. Here's right. all the brands that sell direct online and you can kind of, but pool your resources like a, like, like a, like a, like you do in real life, right? Like on main street, you have a business development group uh, that comes together and say, you give me a buck, you give me a buck and we'll do some great stuff and bring people to our, our community. The same applies online. I think, I think it's a winning strategy because uh, it is, you know, it leverages what you can compete with, which is your physicality, your presence in the community, but you got to get awareness and, and that's not cheap anymore. Right. Great, great point. Uh, next piece. Uh, this one I, I laugh at all the time because I, I always, you know, you have code freezes and 
you, people <laughs> think that the holidays are so busy, but at the same time, yeah. people kind of shut down. The holidays are a bad time to evaluate new technologies is one that I hear consistently. Mm. Uh, love to hear your take on that. Well, you know, it's, it's, there is some merit to, to locking down your code time and planning for peak, but at the end of the day, you start to get to a cycle where, you know, you can't lose six months of development time. And, and this is also philosophically moving from, you know, your bulk development to an agile format, right? And, you know, being agile means that you're always developing and iterating and you're not going to code lock. Right. Um, I think there's probably some, but I think the challenge with code, like if I unpack that concern is, you know, I'm only doing updates five times a year and yeah, you know, you don't want a big update in the middle of holiday mm -hmm. because it's massive. It affects everything and you don't know all the implications, but if you're doing the agile approach um, and I've heard Simon Rodrigue talk about this, you know, very frequently is a little bit by little bit, by little bit, you're not, you're not going to break anything significant and you can fix it. So right. don't, you know, freeze up six months of, of coding time. So, uh, you know, you got to have the right organization for it. You got to be agile, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you, what do you got? Do you guys code lock? I mean, what's, what's your experience in your career? Yeah. I mean, ultimately when I started off, it was shutting things down. You don't, don't, uh, don't risk the, uh, golden quarter during, uh, those, those peak golden seasons because <laughs> we don't, and then, uh, then you would start fresh in, in January, but, Ultimately, now it's it's much like you said. You have an agile approach. You get you get your your work done. Some smaller releases. Nothing. You shouldn't be launching anything major like a new platform. But right. um, but tweaking, I think, is ongoing. And you know what this question also represents is the fact of should you be meeting new partners? Like if say I'm leveraging Bizarre Voice, do I want to reevaluate a different partner during the holiday season um, for ratings and reviews and in my standpoint is, you know, I'm, I'm always learning and meeting with new providers because hmm. if, if I'm not doing it in the golden quarter, because it's, um, too, too, too risky of our business, then that I'm now six months behind. Cause I know I'm not right. getting anywhere to implementation until June, July, August, yeah. if I haven't had those meetings in Q4. So uh, to me, it's, it's just an always on strategy now for, for meeting and, and engaging with uh, yeah. suppliers. You know, one, one of the pieces of advice I, I, I would give everyone listening, the, it, particularly if you're running a shop like you, is have your existing vendors repitch you mm. a, as, if, as if they're brand new. And I guarantee, I can pretty much guarantee you will find out they have a feature that you're not using that you might even be looking for. Like, have them have them come in and repitch you and you'll find so many interesting things i never knew we could do that like it's just like spend the cycles to to do that and and it'll be time well spent yeah johnny russo and i touched on that in, in one mm -hmm. of our conversations he he would hold a, a supplier summit when whether that be facebook and and linkedin and all of his partners would come together and talk about what what they can offer and and re-educate and make sure that everyone was aligned with the capabilities from when you launched two years ago with that partner. Uh, I called it vendor rehabilitation meetings, but he, he was <laughs> That sounds a little popular. more strict. Yeah, yeah exactly. He was that's like, really that's like you're saying, that's like you're, you're cut, calling him in for a bit of a beating on the carpet. Um. <laughs> well, I always negotiate on price. So every, yeah, every, yeah. every time it's a renegotiation, but I thought it was a great comment from both you and, and yeah. from Johnny to do that. So um, yeah. next piece is, running an e-commerce store is much cheaper than a bricks and mortar. Uh, yes and not really. I mean, in some ways, uh, it depends how you do it. Mm -hmm. It's more about time than money in some ways. Uh, an e-commerce store, you know, you've got to pay for the people. The platform costs are much lower than they used to be, which is yeah. a real blessing. Um, but it's still, it's still an investment of time. And you've really got to capture those soft costs that really can, you know, cost processing returns, what happens to the returns, higher returns percentage. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I, I think a value, again, it's one of those things, I think you're probably asking the wrong question. Right. Um, you know, moving to, you know, should I open a store or open a website? Yes, right? Uh, the winning proposition is this seamless integration of both. Not necessarily for everyone. And listen, e-commerce is is still a, a technology play, even though the, the pipes are easy, 
uh, easier to connect and easier to stitch together. Um, and it's not easy. Lots of competition and some pretty big global players in this country are some pretty fierce competition. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, you could never get, you, you just can't out innovate. You can't, you certainly can't outspend them to innovate, uh, but you can be pretty clever about it. So, yeah, listen, they they both, they both intersect, right? Listen, at the end of the day, building a store, Warby Parker, for example, announced they're opening 30 more stores on top of their hundred. They drive e-commerce sales. So what mm -hmm. exactly are you, and how are you measuring what the store is there to do? It does a lot of different things and it's a seamless, you know, that's that opportunity to, to be present in a community, to be in the right place, but also to drive e-commerce sales. Then, you know, you think of it differently. Yeah, I, I've been very blessed in my career to do a bricks and mortar and then develop an e-commerce site for it a few times. But I've also been blessed to work with Newegg.com, a pure play online player that I saw transparency to the numbers. And <clears throat> without a bricks and mortar, acquiring customers was actually very, very costly yeah. because we didn't have the brand presence that you know I did with a Walmart or here with, with home hardware. So there's there's other costs like that you have a savings on because you don't have the expenses of the stores, but you with a bricks and mortar strategy, you can leverage those stores in many DCs. Um, yeah. With e-commerce, you have to open up more DCs. So it's it's an offset. A lot of times the the only savings right now that I see is the cost of the platforms have gone way down before. You know, my first website was ATG and Fatwire and it was <laughs> It was an eye watering, eye right. watering, right? Eye watering. And, and now you can do a Shopify store in a weekend and have it up and running yep. and just have to yep. figure out how the, the traffic model is going to work. But I mean, yeah. I mean the, the thing that's gone the other way, though, is is the plat the other type of platforms is, you know, the so whether it's Google, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, uh, TikTok, is the platforms that's harder and harder you know, they're almost like a utility now. You have to be on them, but it's hard to differentiate. It's hard to get, you know, in the early days of Google, I remember the early days, it was great. Hardly anybody was there. You, you know, it's fantastic. Your ROI was just, you know, jumping off the page. You couldn't give them enough money, basically. Um, that's harder these days, right? Because everyone's, you know, it's harder to be more present on Facebook than your competitors. It's harder to be more clever about buying keywords on Google. Uh, they're almost necess necessary as foundational elements. So what is it that's going to take you over the top? You know, social media, how you use it, how you build community, how you build customer service, how you leverage your stores. Yeah. And even when you talk about the paid search escalating in price, now it's even more expensive because people are buying your branded terms. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's not a great strategy, but they, yeah. they do it and it just drives up the paid search costs even more. So yeah. Great. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, listen, you, we all know retailers, some retailers have done fantastic during the COVID era. Some retailers have really suffered, uh, but the <clears> platforms <throat> uniformly have done really well. And mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice. I, you know, I, I worked for George Heller at uh, Zeller's um, and he, he I remember at a meeting, he said, I want us to be successful. I don't want the vendors rolling up in the best cars. I want us to have the nice cars, too. So, you know, uh, this infrastructure can't all be one-sided. We've all got to make money and, um, you know, you and me struggling to, to make sales. Um, the platforms have done, a, have made out pretty well. Uh, so, you know, time for a, a, a rec, not a reckoning, a reckoning is too harsh a word, but, uh, you know, partnership is not too soft a word. So somewhere in between uh, where that, that needs to be, you know, the need to come and help, but you know, they've done well, all of which is to say it's not easy to build traffic. You got to you got to try 10, 20 things, not one thing anymore that works. Yeah. And you also have to understand your audience and what works for your yep. audience or in the different personas that you're going after may not work for uh, another retailer. So um, it's it's a mix and you got to do a lot of testing, learning to uh, to find that right mix. The next piece is. Um, this one's funny. I, I had a laugh at this because I've never experienced this, but um, it is a myth that's out there that product data is easy. <laughs> oh my God. What a myth that is. Product data is the hardest thing. It, you know, it's a little easier now, but it, it I can tell you when I launched hbc.com, the vendors had no idea. Like I, I, I'd send out these sheets for facts. Yeah, and I would of two hundred products, and I want the cube of the of the of the package, and I got ones for everything right. from one vendor. 
yeah. had no idea, right? They, so I actually hired someone to go into the Zeller store for a summer job and measure products, right? Just to get the dimensions right. Just to get the dimensions right. Just yeah. to get the dimensions. Yeah. <laughs> Not even right. Um, things are better now, but product data is hard, man. And, and the, whether it's metadata or product data, uh, it could be hard and it could be tricky. There's, it, we're way better off than we were 20 years ago. Um, but I still see websites where the data just doesn't answer, like it's thin. It doesn't have, yeah. you know, doesn't really tell me everything I need to know. It, it, it is one of those block and tackling things I think is, um, I think too easily overlooked uh, that if you've got some data that's okay, it, for some items, you want as much data as you can get, and that's still a great thing to have. Yeah, and I think, you know, I do a lot of storytelling with our suppliers on why good data is so important, especially when you're you're doing compare features on the website or you have the navigation yeah. and you're allowing customers to, to put in some more requirements to get to the right item. And if we don't have those pieces of data, then the site's never going to perform or you're not going to convert. Uh, as yep. well as you as you can. So getting us the right amount of data and images and <clears throat> 360 or video content that go along with it now is even more critical. And I, I think consumers, because they're so savvy, um, they it's now table stakes. It's an expectation to have yep. those things. And when the suppliers don't need, don't give it, and we have to go put an item on a dimensionalizer and get the dimensions, Ugh. it's just it just delays the process of getting that item yeah. up onto the website and. They have that information. They've give you can see it on a competitor's website, but somebody didn't fill out the file, and it's just um, so data is not easy. Yeah. And then taking it from legacy systems and importing it onto a website—that's a whole Tough. other episode. Tough. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I remember at the Shopping Channel, the descriptions were all very short form because the fields mm -hmm. weren't big enough. And initially, we thought we could, you know, port over all the descriptions from the product masters, but the descriptions didn't work. They were blue blah, you know, they, they, they just, you know, we had to start from scratch uh, on some of those systems. So, um, you know, it, and you see that demonstrated when you look at your receipt, if you shop on a store, some descriptions are great. Some descriptions you can't even, you don't even know what you just bought. There's so many short forms in it. You have no idea what you just bought on, on your receipt because it's so right. concocted, you know, it's so, uh, it's so shortened and, and for other good reasons, but not for e-commerce. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times when you start off on an e-commerce site, the company's only ever done flyers or shelf tags, and the the information was just designed for that. So now we got to go back and scrub it and recreate it and yep. make sure it's unique as well, because uh, God forbid it be the same as someone else's Dewalt drill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, so I've I've bought, I mean, yeah. recently experienced right. I bought a part from a store. And it, it was the same brand of the air compressor, not the air compressor, but the power washer. And uh, it was it was merchandised with it. Didn't fit. Didn't work. Like it was it was the same brand. It was a quick connect thing, yep. but it didn't fit. And it was merchandised with the same with that product. I'm like, oh, my God, that's, that's now I got to return it, you know. Um, yeah. But I'm a little frustrated because, if, you know, just merchandise the right item. But I know behind the scenes that takes the right data. Yeah, the right data and scrubbing it and making sure that the the affiliated item or the recommended item is is truly those same dimensions. And you know, even just this from converting from metric to imperial um, is is an effort in itself. Yeah. Uh, which usually you're getting one or the other, and no no suppliers consistent. One does one method and one does another. So um, yeah. so I, I wouldn't say that it's easy. It, it has improved, and there's there's content houses that you can purchase content from. And um, I think those things improve the process, but it's, it's not, it's a bit, guy. you know, I, I thought the vendor community, uh, the vendor community has a lot of a big role in that. And yeah. I'll take you back to when Sears was King. And let me tell you when, I, when we launched HBC.com, we were just hoping to take a few nicks out of Sears. Like they were huge. Like they had a $1.7 billion catalog business. They had it all figured out. They had pick and pack. They had eaches. They had people knew how to market and merchandise at the unit level. They had catalogs, yeah. um, you know. And but importantly, very importantly, their vendors were trained on how to ship for that format. And that's the part, you know, how they ship items um, in apparel. It's it's are they singly wrapped or do they come in a big box that's all in a hanger, which is you know two hours of rework. 
So the, the you know the vendors, and now I think the next generation of that because this podcast isn't a history lesson, the next generation <laughs> of that is, is perfect, is getting to a place where it's purpose built packaging. In other words, I know I don't want to just uh, it's not the same packaging to take it off the shelf, put it in a box, and ship it to a home. We know that for some mm-hmm. items, it doesn't work. Um, purpose built packaging. P and G's done some great work on Tide, for example. It ships in a box, right? It's made to be shipped e commerce. I think that's the next step in in vendor packaging and, and innovation that purpose built and now you're hitting the percentage of sales that that makes sense financially right there yeah. you've hit that economic threshold where it makes sense for them to have an on-shelf format and an e-commerce format from a packaging perspective that'll take the movement and the gyrations and the you know one vendor i one retailer i shop from puts tape around all the liquid seals yep right somebody's i think somebody's doing that in the warehouse i think yeah, um, they are, but it's a good, it's a good idea, right? It's it. Sh- they should ship from the factory that way. This is your yeah. e-commerce order. This is your store order. Again, you needed volumes to, to go up. I think we got that now. Yeah, and I mean, in a wholesale environment, you're still dealing with a single pick versus a case pack pick, and yep. what's what's easier and what's more profitable. And a lot of times, those you you reduce your inventory and your selection because picking an item that's a single pick is is really not worth it for for a retailer. So. You maybe you try to sell five rolls of, of duct tape, but is is that a natural experience for a customer to buy that much duct tape? No. So you end up taking that item out of the equation because the packaging is not right for an e-commerce standpoint. So great, yep. great points there. Yeah, you gotta um, break it out. And... Anyway, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so <clears throat> I guess we've got a couple more here. Uh, promoting an e-commerce site is is difficult, and and I. I do agree. It's it's difficult, yeah. From to get a lot of traction, I don't think it's difficult in the tactics that are available to you to promote it. So, you know, you you mentioned that you're going to be doing a podcast focused on some entrepreneurial stuff. Um, <clears throat> I've done many business with hockey socks on my own. This podcast, and I yeah. can leverage. I leverage my own social media accounts. I leverage my network to to spread the word. So, viral marketing is so important. And yeah, uh, influencer it, marketing. It, um, influencer marketing. So you don't need a big budget to really no. get things going. I think the hardest part is for an entrepreneur or someone starting out is to make sure the metrics are right. Make sure your advertising mm-hmm. dollars are not outweighing your profitability because yeah. then it becomes overwhelming. You have to you have to really figure out that that proper mix for your PL so you can stay in business and keep building on to your, right. your advertising dollars. Yeah, I mean, the, the great news about uh, platforms like Google, Facebook, Snapchat, they they make it so easy for you to to use them if you think about yeah. it, right? Like you can you can you can play with multinational companies. You can have that same. The other side is that they make it really easy for you to spend money with them. <laughs> um, so you know, you just got to be careful. Your 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 advice is well uh, well spoken. Is is just be careful. Um, spend your money wisely and and know your customers and know your product, you know, what's different about your product. Why would, you know, is your offering remarkable? Is it something different? Um, it is very easy. The easiest thing in the world is to give a search marketing company a uh, hundred dollars to go buy stuff. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, it may not be the most efficient or productive or effective thing to do. Um, and that's where the, that's where the fun starts, right? Bit of influencer, bit of sampling, bit of this, bit of that, bit of being clever. And uh, that's, you know, being a great entrepreneur and, and that entrepreneurism takes root at all levels of, of corporations where they look for all kinds of interesting solutions to uh, to get out there and get people aware and be consistent at it. Right. You got to be consistent. Uh, yeah. And I think you got to look at do you want to be like spray and pray? Do you want to get it just in front of eyeballs or do you want to yeah. be very targeted and specific and focus yep. on conversion to your core audience first? And then you get on to spending dollars that are just more maybe top line funnel versus bottom line funnel. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Lots and lots of great resources for, for people to go learn about these things. Right. Um, you know, before you, we kind of had to make it up again where this isn't a history lesson, but now there's, there's a <laughs> lot of resources for you, including the vendors, the vendors uh, of these platforms are great at teaching you how to use them. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, they, they, I think, I think they, they take an enlightened perspective that said, you know, if we take a hundred dollars from you and never see you again, that's not a great relationship. So let's teach right. you how to use the platform properly and you will have a long-term relationship. So I think they're very sophisticated and, and I think that's a very successful approach. 
But I love the comment. You keep saying that it's not a history lesson, but ultimately, if we're going to to really um, have success, we gotta we gotta watch some of the the mistakes that were made by other retailers. And yep. you know, you you talk about Sears. The catalog model was e-commerce. Um, look at consumers distributing, right? The whole <laughs> like, they were ahead of their time. And they, they absolutely <laughs> were. I mean, it just you know, wrong place at the wrong time. I mean. Uh, you know, there's many models that they're BOPUS, right? Like yep. it was walk in, order something, and they kind of deliver it and hand it to you. Uh, it just fell out of fashion. I've, some folks have tried to launch it again, but you know, these, uh, you know, Sears is is the poster child. I, you know, the the catalogers had it made. We thought, yeah, uh, if you were a cataloger, you you ticked all the boxes, like you could not fail. But they somehow managed to fail. Um, well, I think you the know, failure comes in the fact that. Are you willing to reinvent, pivot, do test and learn, or are you going to stay with what works? And when you stay with what works too long, you become irrelevant. Well, what 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 I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's a great business case, but I think on their catalog business, they they stayed siloed. It was the catalog yeah. business and the store business, and the two didn't meet. And over time, people expected them to merge together. I want to buy what's in the store online. Um, and I think the two, you know, those silos belong on farms kind of yep. thing, right? Uh, is, is that eventually that and many other things kind of, you know, led to the demise of, of the catalog business and, and, you know, they, they had a great business, right? It was a billion dollar business of people, you know, placing orders online and, and they were a big part of many small communities. It was a gathering yep. place to go to place an order and, and to pick it up. And so, you know, communities, small communities, uh, you know, miss it across yeah. across the country you home hardware is in small communities it's a real it's a real blessing um but in some small communities they they miss that other piece right that yeah. access to the broader assortment they sure do they they uh they loved being able to to get those um apparel type items and and just you know it felt yeah. like it was canadian to them and by not well you can get a refrigerator right like if, if you could go on yeah. a sears and you and if you had a cottage up northern canada they would figure out and they had the infrastructure to have, okay, Bob, we need to get a, you know, a refrigerator onto an island cottage in Temiskaming. Yeah, that's Bob. He's got a canoe and, you know, like they had all that figured out. Yeah. Like that infrastructure disappeared, actually. It fell apart and it still hasn't been rebuilt in the same way. Yeah, great point. So history lesson. Make sure you pay <laughs> attention to retail history. Um, okay, <clears throat> sales will normalize or return to a normal uh, normal state in retail after COVID? Uh, well, it depends what you call normal. I think there's gonna be what the uh, what the finance people call a dead cat bounce. In other words, there'll be a huge rush back to stores. I mean, stores have been closed for 150 days in some parts of Canada, not yeah. others. And, and I think people will go back to stores. We all yearn to have a more normal life and shopping is part of a more normal life. Um, but I don't think, spoken differently that e-commerce is going back to where it was, right? The water line is going to go up. We don't understand. I don't understand all the changes that are about to happen in, in retail. Anyone who tells you they know uh, exactly what's going to happen, I don't know where they're getting their information because we just don't know. It's been such a tremendous change. I think there will be a normalization. I think it's going to, I think it's going to take us another year to figure out the real impacts of the COVID era because right. there's, you know, when I talk to retailers today, they're like, I don't even look at 2020 numbers. They're meaningless. They don't mean anything. I look at 2019, LLY, last yeah. last year. 2020 numbers were so bizarre. 2020 numbers are so bizarre. What the hell lessons am I going to learn from them? Um, so the key is understanding, and we don't all understand this exactly. What's the difference between the accommodations, the changes, the consumers, and we made to accommodate for the COVID era versus what's going to stick? Like right. what's a structural change? Um, and we can make some assumptions. We can assume e-commerce water lines gone up uh, from where it was before. We can assume it's gonna recede a bit. There's no question when stores open up, there'll be less e-commerce, right? Yeah. Um, but it's moved it forward and you're still gonna see that growth. You're already seeing it of it off today. Last year is up 70%. This year, so far this year, it's up 50%. You're not gonna post numbers like 50% growth year after year. right? But right. you will return to double digit growth, which is what it was in the before time. But I, what I find fascinating though, about this thought process is that we're still, we're still calling it e-commerce sales. And to me, it's just part of the mm -hmm. retail mix. 
Yeah. And <clears throat> so are consumers going to rush back to the store? Yes. But are you as a retailer that's selling apparel still getting that customer sale because you have the, the mobile site, you have your e-commerce traditional desktop site and you have the store. So ultimately, regardless of which channel, don't you just want them shopping with you? Um, so yeah. I, I mean, I mean, there, there are some big exceptions, right? There's, there's, you know, brands you and I can think of that are major apparel retailers that do not sell online right. and are very successful. Right. So, yeah. you know, there's no firm laws in this about consumer behavior. They've got a very unique value proposition and it works well in bricks and mortar. They could probably, I think they're getting outflanked by some resale sites and by other different concepts. Mm -hmm. I think, I think they're, they're, they're losing momentum and they're being outflanked. So I, I'm not sure they can continue to do the same approach in exactly the same way. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, it, it gets right back to the beginning of the conversation, this, this blurring of the lines, right? Yeah. Um, when we talk about what's e-commerce percentage versus what's brick and mortar is asking the wrong question. Yeah. It's, it's, it's at the end of the day, uh, it's retail, right? Influenced yeah. by bought online, return to store, you know, all the number of wonderful ways that we can serve customers as a, as an industry. Yeah. How do we grow our p and and yeah, and that's that's you know share of the pie, right? That's yep. that's you know a bit bigger, better offer. That's being more compelling. That's being a great merchant. You guys got great merchants. They find unique items that solve problems. They do all those things, uh, and that you know businesses who win have kind of figured out where they exist and can thrive on that spectrum of experience, luxury, value, and uh, and luxury, right? Experience. Yeah. What did I say? Ex e efficiency, experience, <laughs> experience, efficiency, value, and luxury. You got to figure out where you're going to live because if you're in the middle, uh, that's it's probably the danger zone. Yeah, it's great, great. So, Michael, I've loved chatting with you. We're we're well into this conversation, and I could chat with you for three, four more hours because we just we talk and talk retail forever. But yeah, we only fantastic. have one more one more myth to go here, and this is <clears throat> this is one where constantly people are like because they're a Canadian bricks and mortar retailer, they feel that they should focus on delivering e-commerce. Funny, see how I did that there? Very delivering e-commerce in, in their Canadian market. But the reality is there's a, there's a conversation I think that needs to happen is, do you need to sell within your core or should you go cross border and look at a new market with your e-commerce operations? And uh, the myth a lot of people think is, wait, let me get Canada right first, and then I'll look into uh, cross-border selling into the U.S. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it <clears> comes <throat> down to what your value proposition is. If you're selling, if you're selling the same things, and we we asked ourselves this many times at Hudson's Bay, like many times, and and the question in early days, well, why don't you go global? And we had some differentiated product. Think of the point blankets, think of the heritage products that had a global appeal. But, you know, at the end of the day, most of the business was done with, with a let's say, a KitchenAid stand mixer. And if you're going to you're gonna try and do business in the United States or anywhere else and you don't have physical stores, then you're in the pure play killing round right. of pure play retail. And you've got no advantage. You've lost all your advantage. So I think it gets down to what you sell and how you sell it. Is it differentiated? There's a market to sell some stuff, but again... You know, I, I, is that a winning strategy? Can you do it? Hey, listen, there's some great advantages selling into the U.S. market. There, uh, de minimis is eight hundred dollars. There's no taxes. Um, if you've got a differentiated product, there's no reason to wait. You right. get, you know, there's some great partners that will take it across the border for you. You know, from Purelator to eShop, great partners. Take currency again. There's another thing you can take foreign currency. So from that perspective, you know, go to China. Does your product have value in China? The, massive amounts of products being purchased. Is it different? Can you win? Um, can you have a better advantage than just, you know, being a physical brick and mortar merchant? Because that gives you an advantage. Without that, you better be careful uh, because you're, as I said, you you could be in this pure play killing zone where, you know, you're up against everything and all you've got to hang is is your product. Unless you've got fantastic product that's differentiated that people want. We can think of many examples, right? Like a Canada Goose, a Roots, uh, Lululemon, very successful international companies, right? Yeah, yeah, great. The uh, I had the luxury of uh, being with a company for a couple of years, Big Owls. Um, they were aquatics mm -hmm. industry and selling yep. um, everything to maintain your your my fish, fish my fish salt. tank. Yep, 
Yeah, yeah shop and, the Big Owls. Uh, yeah, know them well. They're they're a great organization, but they also had the franchise model, and the franchisees were really um, against e-commerce. Uh, they thought it would yeah. take away business from them. So while we had uh, an e-commerce website for for the Canadian market, we quickly focused on the U.S. because we had this great assortment and it was unique. And right. that business grew so fast in in the U.S. market. And um, I don't think we ever looked back at the Canadian market because the U.S. <laughs> was just it was fantastic. You, all of a sudden, you got 300 million people at the time that were engaged in 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 your products versus okay, let's. Let's argue and fight with our franchise owners. Let's try to make this work in a population of, you know, 30 million people at the time. Yep. And how many of them are actually one in, interested in, in aquatics. Yep. And then you go into this bigger market with a unique product. And that's now the key. That's the key. You've got, you had a, a unique differentiated market. And by the way, there is a model where franchisees can win. And that, you know, when I, I was running, uh, helping run Pandora jewelry, which is largely franchise driven. And it was the same debate. And and at the end of the day, I I was heading up marketing, and uh, the franchises were like, drive traffic, drive me store traffic, take me get. I said, look, I got a solution for you. I'll sell online, you fulfill. I'll drive traffic like you've never seen before. And Pandora was a wholesaler, right? Because Pandora made the product. It was a win-win. Culturally, it took a long time. I don't. I'm not even sure they're there yet. But that's just a, like, don't fight them. Right. You know, come together. Like if you fight them, you're you're both gonna lose. Yeah, Listen, exactly. You, you know, you yeah, get in a fight you with your to. franchisees, you're going to lose. Um, you, even if you win, you're probably going to lose. But, you know, one of the things franchisees want, who doesn't? Store traffic. I'll get you store traffic. Do buy online, pick up and store. And when they're there, by the way, you guys are amazing at upsell and cross-sell. Have at it, right? Yeah. And and uh, so that was a great discussion. And, and there's other models. You know, Canadian Tire, for example, has dealers and franchises, home hardware as well. Um, there's a win-win there. There's absolutely a win-win there. Um, it sometimes is a little more harder to figure out, but um, both can win or neither <laughs> if you're not careful. Well, I think if you can get the attribution right for the stores and the the online model, everyone can find a way to win. And it's just yep. you can't have one outweighing the other because the, if you want your your home office to succeed um, and grow your business, it it can't be doing this without a profitable model and if you want more traffic you got to allow some of those dollars to come back into the the home office so that we can take advantage of those dollars and and market from a from a brand yeah. perspective and and you know they're asking the home office to drive traffic right that's part right. of your job at the home office there's no cash registers in the home office your job is to create you know create success for the dealers or the store managers or whoever it is uh, that you're serving and and you know, there's ways to do that around clever accounting, but also just pragmatically, you know, many people like to return products to store. Look at what, look at what Amazon did with Kohl's, right? Yes. Uh, Kohl's traffic is up because they're taking Amazon returns. I don't know if that's a long-term good plan for them. Um, but in the short term, it just points us to the direction of, if you can take a return back, you're going to get a store traffic. You're going to get footsteps to the door. Those are hard, man. Those are hard. We forget like, in the before time, driving incremental store traffic, that's hard these days. Like th that's not a, that's not a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> it's hard but to I, drive store traffic. I right? love that test and learn with Kohl's and them doing that. It's just how do they acquire that customer and how do they engage that customer going forward? So if you're yep. just picking up a parcel and saying, thank you, Mr. Customer, I'll take this return versus finding a way to acquire their email address at the same time that they've done that and now communicating with them, like there's, you're right. How, how long can that last without a good acquisition strategy to go along with that return program? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, That's the cool. hope is, and again, we've talked about hope not being the best strategy that, you know, they pick up their order from, in this case, Amazon. And they said, oh, geez, by while I'm here, I'm going to get some other stuff. Because the hardest thing to do, and we learned this at Hudson's Bay running the e-commerce, sorry, running the CRM business. We had 9 million records, right? Mm -hmm. Club, Club Z. We could do great work incrementing the sale once they were in the store, upsell, cross sell. We were, you know, we could do a lot of programs that would get that basket bigger. We couldn't crack the code on getting them to the store, to right. incrementing store. Even back then, it was very hard to motivate someone to get to the store. Once they're in the store, that's where some magic can really happen. Yeah, great points. So, Michael, it's been a pleasure. I've missed over the mine. course of the uh, 
year or so not being able to engage and see you at conferences. And um, thank you so much for taking valuable time out of your evening uh, to spend with me and helping me with my, my new venture on this podcast. I greatly appreciate the support for my whole 20 years in this career. You've been a big part of it and uh, you're, you're a true gentleman and a pleasure to be around. And I, I can't, I can't express how much I appreciate you. Well, Chris, the pleasure is all mine and congratulations on your success. Uh, you know, you've, you've done so well and continue to do so well. So, you know, credit to you, credit to everything you've done and, and uh, happy to be, have some kind of uh, contributing role to that and, and look forward to continuing our discussion uh, here. And, and uh, one time IRL, as the kids would say in real life. All right, my friend, thank you and have a great night. You've been listening to Delivering E-Commerce. It's our passion to have on leaders and suppliers in e-commerce from around the globe, setting you and your strategy up for the next level. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. Connect with Chris on LinkedIn at Chris Parsons on LinkedIn and Spotify at Delivering E-Commerce or on YouTube at Chris Parsons Delivering E-Commerce. Till next time, this is Delivering E-Commerce.